Welcome to episode number 13 of No Traps, No Glory. Sorry, everybody, for the long hiatus. We know it's been hi uh, highly anticipated. Been getting a lot of... Well, that's actually true. Our producer's laughing, but we get, uh, we've get we been getting a lot of questions as to when No Traps, No Glory was going to make its triumphant return. Our, our producer's been inundated with his non-producing job, so he's been unable to really uh, focus on the immense amount of editing that needs to be done for this high quality and highly entertaining podcast that we provide to you guys. Insightful. Insightful as well, yes, thank you. Plus, uh, we had to gather some insight, <laughs> that being said. Uh, today, we I don't, you can't really see too much, but we are coming from the bucolic setting of Brown Streak, i.e. Blue Streak Sports, in uh, Stamford, Connecticut. And uh, I have just competed approximately about, I don't know, let's say about, about 45 minutes ago. 45 minutes, maybe an hour ago. Uh, I just graced the platform and uh, did, did a little bit of lifting myself. And that kind of brings in, I thought it'd be a good idea to do a follow-up of you know, however I did. Didn't know how it was going. Obviously, you never know how you're going to do. But um, follow-up on my performance and do it in podcast form to capture my first... Uh, or my, hey, my first reaction, if you will. So um, I'm going to kind of backtrack and go into a few things from here. But um, prior to when I became a coach, this, this is going to segue into everything. I, I went to school for teaching originally and because I thought that's what I wanted to do. It just kind of naturally worked out in that favor because uh, all the, the credits that I, I did have a major declared for a while and all the credits I took led from one to the next and turns out just... Uh, history and education and such was the logical choice given the amount of courses that I had under my belt and the direction that I should head and, and then at the same time a, uh, a good friend of mine's wife worked out of school and introduced me and got me a job uh, where I at least started substituting while I was doing uh, while I was going to school and eventually did student teaching and grad school through there so um, originally went to school to become a teacher and it, it, I had a lot of fun when I worked in the school I, I loved the kids they were great um, I mean, I, honestly, they were the ones that I really enjoyed the most about it. The, the, a lot of the faculty were great people, some great people on the faculty, but then there were some other people where they, they were younger than I, but you, you would have thought they were 20 years older given how miserable they were and how they complained. Um, ambitions of administration and such. And, and, and honestly, it just it, it turned out to be something that I really didn't fit in well with, and I think that's just my mentality. And I, I got along incredibly well with the students. I mean, I, I even at one point, actually, they wanted to dedicate the yearbook to me, but the administration wouldn't allow that because I wasn't considered a full-time faculty member when I was working. At least um, when I had a, a leave replacement, I wasn't con even considered a full-time faculty member. So uh, unfortunately, they couldn't get the yearbook dedicated to me. But that says a lot about at least the student body and, and also, too, the administration. And that's actually, I wanted to say that to the producer's little caveat or side note right here. Did you notice the amount of uh, police state traffic cams and stuff going on in the state of Connecticut here and all the traffic lights? I mean, police state. If you don't think we're in a police state, we're in a police state. It's just, it's just salient right now. But uh, I digress. That's neither here nor there at this juncture. No, keep that in there. I want people to hear that. Um, but anyway, I, I remember there was there was a point where I, when I was, I was actually debating: is this something that I really want to do? Is this a career path that I want to follow? Working with te uh, with teaching, that is. And uh, my cousin, he's a teacher down in the Bronx. Great guy, incredibly funny. Uh, and I remember him saying, and this stuck with me for a very long time. He said, "Those who can do do; those who can't teach." And once I heard those words, it was just like, oh, and I think subconsciously is why I, from that moment that I knew that I could probably never teach simply because I don't consider myself someone that's incapable or not a doer or someone that can do. And I like to consider myself one that's a doer. And with the state championships coming up, with the creation of the gym and everything like that, I, 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 I at least would believe that that is, that is the act of a doer. And the further ambitions that I have and down the road, the ideas that I have in the future is something of someone who, someone who likes to accomplish and do things and challenge themselves and such and that leads us here to today so i coach people yes but i'm still an active lifter i still train under my coach i still compete today wasn't the best competition that i've had when i competed in april i did much better at least the snatch portion i did much better and the clean and jerk i did the same um 
And, and, and really my thoughts on that, obviously you could be disappointed and such. I mean, I know what I did wrong in the snatch. I, I know what I could do better in the clean and jerk. Um, let's say the last competition that I did, I'm saying a lot of ums. I usually don't say ums a lot. So apologize. I don't like that. That's a pet peeve of mine. But when I competed in April, my focus was different. For whatever reason, it, it may have been. My focus was different. But my training leading up to that was a lot different than my training now and you really I mean it's just the nature of lifting and you have to understand that and, and so let's say I think the most that I may have snatched in the competition that I did prior to April was maybe maybe 110 I think that was the most that I ended up working with in training uh, as well in the clean and jerk maybe one time I went up to 140 or so but when I competed in April I went three for three in the snatch. I went 111, 115, 118. And then in the clean and jerk, I went 137, 142. Uh, and actually, I missed four. I missed, just brain fart, missed 42 clean, which I've never missed a clean ever, but it was a complete brain fart, and then came back and made it easily. Whereas today, uh, my training has been great leading up to this competition. I snatched 120, I clean and jerked 147 and a half, but on the platform, I opened with 111, made that. They gave me a press out on a 115 snatch, and then a 117 snatch that I followed up with, I just sent sailing behind me uh, about 30 feet. And then the clean and jerk, opened with 36, made that nicely, uh, went to 142, just kind of spazzed out on the jerk, focusing too much because I was thinking too much. And then the last clean and jerk, 142, just made it. And it, I, I don't know how it looked to some people, but to me it felt effortlessly as if I should be and should have been in all reality attempting the 147 or 148. So you really never know what you're going to be facing when it comes to when you step on the platform. There's so many variables, so many circumstances. A good friend of mine who right now, Steve F. Carpetis of NSG, never stop grinding. He's uh, in Egypt right now training with Mohammed Ahab and he's just been texting me little tips that he's been learning. And one of the things that they were saying is how that any stress, anything from outside of outside life that creeps into your lifting is going to affect it. And so who knows, perhaps maybe with the preparation for state championships, made me too rigid in the snatch, whatever stresses I may have had with that. Or I mean, just the nature of it. You never know what you're going to get any given day at, uh, um, what was it, Masters. Master. When was Masters? Venerable producer? Uh, March 29th. March 29th. March 29th. So actually it was a session when our venerable producer was, was lifting. Uh, and... Uh, the longtime New York State lifter Jim Storch, he was just giving feedback, just asking him different questions on, on things. And I remember him, remember him telling me uh, one tale about how he competed one day, it was probably a Saturday or so, let's say Saturday, competed one day Saturday, made a snatch record, but missed what he wanted to make in the clean and jerk. Then he competed the following day, didn't make as well in the snatch, but then made his clean and jerk record. So with lifting, you, you never know what to expect. You never know what's going to come. You could prepare as much as possible, but... You want to obviously put yourself in the best circumstance to be able to achieve the best result. And whatever the day brings is what the day brings. You're going to, whatever happens on the day is what's going to happen. So, and this is something I've learned. There were times where I remember, uh, let's say probably about four or five years ago when I competed here, had a terrible meet. Training was good, but then I went to, uh, to the competition platform and you would have thought I never lifted in my life. It was a completely different person. Mentally, maybe I was just nervous, whatever it could have been, but lifted terribly. But then there are times where you have a terrible meet then you have a good meet training may not necessarily reflect what you're going to do in competition but at the same time uh, it's just it's it's got always going to be unpredictable and going back around to what I was saying in the beginning about let's say my given the history of my teaching background and such like that and being a doer and doing is that uh, let's say what I've, I've probably been competing about I don't know, maybe eight, nine, oh, ten years. I'm, I really don't remember the exact year that I started offhand. I, I'm probably sure I could look it up, but I've grown a lot as a lifter in that time, and especially as a coach, all the experience that I gather from this goes into applying to my lifters. One of my lifters here that I give uh, flack to all the time about how she lifts and being stiff and, and such, I ended up doing the same thing. And you have to be able to relate to your lifter. And I think the only way that you can actually do so, and, and again, no offense to coaches who have never competed or just got into coaching and such, but ultimately, I personally don't understand how you can coach without having ever competed before because there's no way to really truly relate to an athlete to be able to understand the circumstances, situation, the training 
without going through it yourself. And that goes for anything in life. You had, and, uh, and I mean, not to, I'm not getting political in any aspect here, but you have those who, let's say, uh, career, career academics, people who go to college just co- consistently say in the academic world that have ideals, ideas, perspectives on how things should be, but they've never stepped out of the realm of idealism and walked through, walked in the shoes of what reality actually is. And I th- personally, I think, and this was my coach, he competed, his father competed, in order to be able to truly relate, to truly be able to produce, to truly be able to provide and also know how to push people and also just not even, just just not accept nonsense out of people, you have to do it yourself. And I can't, actually, it's, it's funny because before, um, before I started competing today, Mark and I were sitting and talking, Mark, my coach, and he was just saying how lifting's changed a lot from when he was doing it to the way it is now. Hopefully we're not getting, the wind's blowing right now. Hopefully the wind's not blowing in front of the microphone. I'll try to cover it. So we, we want to be able to hear this clearly. But he was just saying how back when he was a lifter and in the days, I mean, he lifted in the, I mean, mainly 70s, 80s, into 90s perhaps, or so within that time frame and early on, how you the, the traditional lineage was that you became a, a lifter, you were a lifter first, then you became a coach, then eventually you went to refereeing and perhaps even into administration after that. And there was a constant lineage and that with that lineage, it helped promote the sport, helped develop the sport and maintain continuity in the sport. But now it seems that there is a lot of, from what he was saying, where there's there's no continuity. You have those who never either were never lifters, become coaches and then try to coach, or those who were never lifters become coaches and try to go into administration and vice versa, or referee. And it creates a lot of incongruity to the development of the sport. Uh, and let's let's just say this is something that Mark is very passionate about in now his saying how refereeing is in the United States relative to the world. And what we have with that is that he says the the job of the referee back in the day was to judge the lift and favor the lifter because obviously you want to promote lifting and help develop lifting. Now the job of the referee is to just to scrutinize the elbow lock. Uh, I, I mean, I was subject to that today. Obviously, that's the referee's decision. I'm not arguing or debating that. Um, and the idea behind the referee doing that is to make, quote, make the lifter better, let's say. But internationally, if you look, the referees are a little bit more lenient. Uh, and does that necessarily help the sport or does that hinder the sport? That's another question. And this is kind of, I'm going to tie this all back around in case I'm getting off a little bit. But going with that, I, and, I, and this also too, someone posted a video of back in the early 90s of this one lifter who uh, made a national record. And what by today's standard was passed, three white lights, but by today's standard, there was a slight motion in his elbow as he came up that would have been probably red lights. So the question is, and the approach that I take is, ultimately, you have to be, you, you can't be involved in something without going through the process of being involved in something, if that makes sense. If you're going to become an electrician, you be, start your apprenticeship, you work under somebody for X number of years, then you become a master and you work into that. And the same thing with weightlifting. You have to be involved in the sport. And I like to think, and I really appreciate all my lifters who came out to watch and support me because even though I didn't have my best competition, even though I'm at at best, I am a a decent local lifter at best, Um, not to diminish myself or speak down to myself, but ultimately that's, that's what it is. But the fact of the matter is that I still do it. I still enjoy doing it. I still try to lead by example and, and put myself out there and train hard. So that way, not only do I can do better for myself, which I want to do, and I, I know I have a lot more in me and I'm capable of a lot more, especially after today, I know that uh, there's much more that I can achieve and I'm not at my potential. And had I not competed, I wouldn't have that perspective. I wouldn't have that understanding of knowing how much more capability there is and the steps. It, again, everything's a learning experience. So the steps to take to now better myself and then also to better the, my lifters that I have and at the same time inspire them. So I'm not happy with my results, capable of a lot more, but it is what it is. And uh, every, everything you do, uh, you, you, hopefully you learn from. So that being said, we'll close out from on our location. That was a very long diatribe. Usually we take little breaks for editing purposes, but this is going to be a big and hopefully uh, this computer doesn't, our editor's computer doesn't freeze up on this. But um, thank you, everybody. We'll be back with a lot more on this. 
Um, no Traps, No Glory, episode 13, closing out from location. Again, this bucolic setting. Maybe you take a picture of this. Uh, but until next time.